Welcome, everyone. Sorry about the technical snag. Not sure what was going on there. Uh, appreciate you all coming out tonight. It's your host, Danny Hai Fong. As you can see, I'm joined by two very special guests uh, waiting on Ray McGovern. Hopefully, he is able to come on this evening. But in any event, uh, first, I just want to introduce uh, Larry C. Johnson. He is a first timer on this show. Uh, I've been following his work closely on matters, especially regarding Ukraine. He is a veteran of the CIA and State Department's Office of Counterterrorism. He is also a co-founder of Berg Associates. Uh, you can find his telegram and his Substack in the video description. We also have Scott Ritter, former UN Marine Corps officer and UN weapons inspector. And he also curates and is everywhere, uh, but he curates scottritterextra.com. Uh, welcome, guys. Thanks for coming on to the program. Glad to be with you. Though. Thanks. Thanks for the, the new term curate. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, uh, there's there's and that's a that's a broad word. I feel like it's used. Uh, so um, you're welcome, Scott. Anyway, let's let's get right to it. How about we get right to it? So we are exiting year 2023. All right. And for everyone who's watching these final days, make sure you like the stream. Um, that helps get more viewers here. But we're exiting now the year 2023. And I think it's a good time to reflect on the major geopolitical developments that have been ongoing over the past year. And of course, we have some help. We have uh, Mr. Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State. Many view him as the point person in the Biden administration, given the state of Joe Biden himself, but he had some interesting things to say, uh, and maybe some infuriating things to say in his end of the year press conference. And I just wanted to read what he had to say about uh, Russia and Ukraine. And of course, Russia was number one in terms of co his commentary, his initial opening remarks during this press conference. And what he had to say was this, we will continue to rally countries around the world to support Ukraine's freedom and independence and ensure Russian aggression remains a strategic failure. Putin has already failed to achieve his principal objective in Ukraine, erasing it from the map, subsuming it into Russia. It's been a hard year on the battlefield, but once again, Ukrainians have done what no one thought was possible. They stood toe to toe with the world's biggest militaries. They conceded no territory despite multiple Russian offenses. And they pushed Russia's Navy back to the Black Sea in the Black Sea and opened a corridor to allow their export of grain and other products to the world. Russia is weaker militarily, economically, and diplomatically. NATO is bigger and stronger and more united than at any point in its 75 year history. This year, we added a 31st member of Finland, and Sweden will soon join. So, Maybe we can start with you, Larry. Uh, your reactions on the state of this conflict and how do the how does your assessment comport with Anthony Blinken's? I guess the the Russians probably get down on their knees every night and say, "Thank God for Anthony Blinken." Anybody that's that delusional and that out of touch with reality is just helping them continue to you know march along. Uh, it is. Uh, it really is mystifying because he's he's not an uneducated man. You know, he's been to some good schools. But to uh, I know that the definition of a diplomat is someone who's paid to lie for their country. But good Lord, uh, th this is just off the charts because uh, not a thing he said was true. Uh, the uh, Simplicius the thinker had a great chart up the other day showing all the naval activity in the Black Sea. And uh, the, the area around uh, Odessa, around the few ports that uh, the Ukraine still controls, had one ship. That was it, one. Uh, so uh, no activity. And the notion that they, uh, what's alarming is that they really genuinely believe that they won some sort of military victory over Russia. And they, they have zero understanding of tactics. So it, it's just... Um, we, we are seeing, though, the signs that things are changing. The fact that the Washington Post removed war in Ukraine from its banner on its website is the sign that even the Washington Post has figured out, you know, the, the party's over here, dude. Uh, turn out the lights. Hmm. Scott, you're, you're in. Well, I mean, I, I echo everything um, Larry said. Um, 
you know, Russia, I mean, Tony Blinken, first of all, invented a, a Russian objective. Uh, the Russian objectives were set forth early on, and they've been consistent throughout, not changing. Uh, demilitarization. Now, <clears throat> the definition of demilitarization has gone through a, uh, a transformation, not because Russia changed the uh, the rules of the game, but because Ukraine and NATO changed the rules of the game. Initially, demilitarization was simply removing NATO influence from uh, from. The Ukrainian military to uh, to 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 eliminate the 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 ability of uh, NATO to influence uh, Ukrainian operations. It wasn't the total destruction of the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, the Russians made a big effort early on in the conflict to have the Ukrainian army stay in their barracks. That was one of their goals and objectives. And of course, the Ukrainians didn't do that uh, everywhere. Some places they did. Uh, I think the rapid advance in the Kherson region. Uh, was reflective of a lack of resistance on the part of the Ukrainians in that area uh, because the Russian FSB had done a good job of going out and um, paving the way, so to speak. But, um, you know, the, the the Russians weren't out to destroy Ukraine. We know this by their uh, the terms of the, uh, the, the, the conflict termination agreement that had been negotiated in three rounds uh, between Ukraine and Russia and Gomel, uh, a, a fourth round in Turkey where they initialed, they being the Ukrainians and the Russians, initialed an agreement for final signature. Um, that signature wasn't forthcoming because of the intervention of Boris Johnson um, and others, including Lloyd Austin, who went to uh, Kiev and told uh, Zelensky, don't sign anything. You see, they interpreted uh, Russia's willingness to negotiate as a sign of weakness. They don't realize that that was the Russian objective from day one. The whole purpose of the initial rush into Ukraine wasn't to seize territory. It was to compel Ukraine to the negotiating table so this conflict could be terminated rather quickly. Um, and, and indeed, one of the other Russian objectives was uh, denazification. What's amazing about the March agreement is there's no denazification. I mean, that was a stated objective of Putin, but the March agreement was they're going to let Zelensky stay in power. No demands on constitutional changes. No demands on, um, you know, elimination of Azov and other things. The only thing Russia, you know, did say is you can't be a member of NATO and you have to be basically be neutral in perpetuity. But Russia was very open to discuss, um, you know, security guarantees. Uh, Russia was open. Uh, first of all, Russia said we're going to return all the territory that we took. <laughs> Literally, we're going to give it back. We have no desire. To what did Blinken say? Subsume, um, you know, Ukrainian territory. They did say that Crimea is theirs forever, but that was 2014. Totally separate issue. They're never going to, they're never going to give any of it back. But Crimea was always Russian. Never going to be Ukrainian. Um, the Donbas. What's interesting is that the uh, Russians said that uh, while they won't, you know, they can't give it back to Ukraine because the Donbas declared independence. Uh, what they said is that. They will continue to be independent, but Russia will work with Ukraine to get a referendum to find out, you know, where the, the citizens of Donbass want to go on that one. The Russians also said they're willing to sit down with the Ukrainians and talk about the political future of Crimea, meaning that they, you know, they say, you want to make a case for Crimea? Let's let's do that. I mean, it's the most reasonable terms one could ever imagine. And uh, it was turned down by the Ukrainians who were led to believe that they could beat the Russians. And um, and so they start the process of receiving uh, what I called the game changer, the, the 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 tens of billions of dollars worth of it. It changed the game. Um, it made the game longer. It made the game more complicated. It required the Russians to mobilize three hundred thousand reserves uh, to expand, um, you know, their military capacity. In addition to three hundred thousand reserves, four hundred seventy-five thousand volunteers have uh, signed up for the special military operation uh, at a rate of 1,500 a day. Uh, the Ukrainians are out there, you know, hijacking a couple hundred guys off the streets every day who don't want to go to the fight. The Russians, are they're just, they're just pouring it. The nation is mobilized around this, willingly so. Um, and the, uh, the, but the purpose was always the destruction of the Ukrainian military, um, you know, in terms of their ability to to influence. The more Ukraine absorbed NATO equipment, the larger the requirement for the destruction of the Ukrainian military. Today, it's 100%. The Ukrainian military will not survive this conflict. It will be 100% eliminated. 
The Ukrainians can decide how they want to do that. They can all die. Russia is more than happy to facilitate that. Russia would prefer that they surrender. Um, and Russia is doing everything possible to encourage surrendering. You now, you know, they have this, uh, this, this, this radio frequency that they're encouraging people. I think Volga, they call it, to, to have uh, people come over and, uh, and, and surrender. But um, anybody who thinks that the Ukrainians have prevailed on this battlefield don't know anything about war. Uh, the Ukrainians have been slaughtered on this battlefield. The Russians are engaged in something called flexible defense. The key aspect of flexible defense is that you don't fight and die for indefensible territory. It understands that in war, on occasion, the enemy can get tactical and sometimes even operational superiority. And when that happens, the smart military leader says, gosh, we probably should withdraw to better defensive ground over here, uh, consolidate our lines, get some fire support in, and break it up. So they, they withdraw. And it's done in a pre-planned area. You go back to positions you've already decided you're going to fall back on. You have fire support coming in, and you break up the Ukrainian attacks. Ukrainians get some territory, but then they all die. Then the Russians counterattack and get the territory back. That's what's been going on. And so, you know, Blinken is trying to lead us to believe that the Russians have made no gains. I don't know. 400,000 dead Ukrainians sounds like a lot of gains to me. Um, uh, hundreds of tanks, uh, including... You know, the Leopards, you remember the Leopard, it was that invincible German tank that was going to change the, the course. No, they're all burning. Uh, the Bradley, the Bradley, oh, it's burning. Uh, the Martyr, it's burning. I mean, you can come up with all the little names they got, they're all burning. Uh, they're out of ammunition, they're out of armor, they're out of everything. Uh, they're out of people. That's why um, we were talking about, you know, Hodges. Uh, talking about the need to get women and old men and everything to replicate what the uh, Germans were doing in 44. It wasn't, I saw a comment, uh, wasn't just uh, about the Russians, you know, the Germans producing more tanks. It was about the mobilization of Germany in 44, uh, the Volkssturm and all this wonderful stuff that uh, was, you know, led to the death of a lot of Germans that didn't need to die. Um, and that's where the Ukrainians are right now with mobilization. I mean, where are they going to come from? Uh, they the, the people don't want to fight. I guess there's 270,000 uh, military age men who fled Ukraine that the Ukrainians are trying to get back in. But do you really think these guys are going to be motivated? I mean, again, war <laughs> is, you know, everybody talks about superior equipment. I always say that the equipment is nice, but what's more important is the quality of the foot and the boot. Um, because that's, that's, that's how you win wars. You don't win wars with a beautiful gleaming tank. You win wars with a guy that knows what he's doing, a guy who's physically fit, a guy who's mentally uh, has mental capacity, who wants to be there, who's motivated to be there, who believes in the mission, who is trained to do this. Ukrainians are getting 13, 14 days basic training. That's it. If they're lucky, they can go to you get that at a NATO course, 14 days, and then they come back and they're given a couple of weeks to learn this new equipment. Then they're thrown into the battlefield. The Russians, meanwhile, when they were mobilized, if you had recent military experience, you put through sort of a refresher course to prove that you knew how to do A, B, and C, and then you were sent in as a like a individual replacement. The rest of the guys were put together into units and put through months of training. Some of them have yet to be committed into combat, and they continuously be retrained. The Russians are pulling units out of the front line, sending them to a training zone to update them on tactics. Larry, you probably drone warfare. What drone warfare yeah. was when conflict started and what it is today is two totally different things. It's a revolution in warfare, what's going on with drones right now. And if you aren't training for it, if you're not preparing for it, adapting this to your tactics and operations, you're going to die. So the Russians are doing this all the time. They're the most well trained, they're the most combat hardened military force in the world today. There's nothing that comes remotely close to what the Russians are. And Tony Blinken thinks that the Russians are losing. The Russians have broken the Ukrainian military. The Ukrainian military has suffered a strategic defeat. What's happening now is that Russia is starting to push steadily. The Ukrainians have admitted they can't continue the counteroffensive. They've gone back on what they call the strategic defense. But it's not a defense in depth. Who is the Ukrainian equivalent of General Alexander Romanchuk? The the guy, the former deputy commander, 5th 8th Army, went to the Combined Arms Academy, was pulled out of the Combined Arms Academy to, uh, after he rewrote Russian defensive doctrine, took charge of the Zaporizhia front right by the Robotino area, and built the defense that crushed the Ukrainian counteroffensive. This is a, a genius in, 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 in military. Who is the Ukrainian equivalent? 
They've all been working on the counterfeit. Suddenly they're going to go over on the defensive. But have they thought it through? Have they prepared it? They're digging trenches. They're putting things out. It looks good. But I can guarantee you, A, they don't have the reserves necessary to do what, you know, to make a flexible defense work. They're looking at fixed defensive lines. The Russians will break through these lines. When the Russians break through, where is the Ukrainian counterattack? They don't have anything anymore. They got no more brigades. They're not making any more brigades. They ran out of money. They ran out of tanks. They ran out of men. When the Russians break through, the Ukrainians got nothing. This war's over. But this doesn't mean that it's all over. I'll give you an example. I think uh, everybody can concede that after the Battle of the Bulge, it was known that Germany couldn't defeat the West. I mean, after the Battle of Kursk in 43, it was known that Germany couldn't defeat Russia. The strategic initiative had changed. What was the bloodiest month for American troops in World War II in the, East, in the, uh, in the, in, in the European zone? Was it June when they went across Normandy? No. Nope. Was it December when they fought the Battle of the Bulge? Nope. Was it in March when they were fighting Hurtgen Forest? Nope. It was April, the last month of the war. April 1945 was the bloodiest month for Americans in the Western theater. Why? The Germans were defeated, strategically defeated. It was done. There was no one. Vegas wouldn't allow any odds on Germany winning this war. That's how bad it was. And yet the Germans killed more Americans that month. Why? Because there's a lot of fight left in a dying animal. Uh, so the implication when I say that Ukraine is defeated, people go, but they're still fighting, Scott. Yeah. And they may fight for months, but it's over. They literally, the strategic initiative has gone over to Russia. And Blinken's just deluding himself. When he talks about and it's not just at the defeat of the uh, Russian army. Vladimir Putin said something very interesting the other day. He said that Odessa is a Russian city. Now, the thing about Putin is he says he doesn't waste words. Vladimir Putin's not a guy that go out and say things. He's not an American politician trying to impress people. When he speaks, his words have meaning, and he says nothing lightly. So when Vladimir Putin comes out and says, no, nah, Odessa is a Russian city, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Odessa is going to be a Russian city. Um, that means this war ain't over till Russia takes Odessa, fills off the Black Sea coast. Now, why would Russia want to do this? Oh, maybe because Great Britain and the United States helped Ukraine turn the Odessa area into a platform to threaten the Russian fleet in Sevastopol and make Crimea, um, you know, to make things untenable in Crimea. Russia will never allow ever again Ukraine to be used in that fashion. So this war cannot end until Russia eliminates Odessa and the Black Sea coast as being a potential strategic zone of operations to threaten Crimea. Crimea is very important to Russia. So Black Sea, Ukraine's lost it. This war won't end until they have it. I spoke to a senior Russian who says he thinks that the uh, that offensive may begin sometime in the May-June time period. Now, why that long? Well, I don't know, because if you're going to take Odessa, you got to take Mikolaev. If you're going to take Mikolaev, you got to take Nepopetrovsk. If you take Nepopetrovsk, you got to secure Kharkov. And so now we just identified what the Russians are going to do. Kharkov, Nepopetrovsk, Mikolaev, Odessa. Secure uh, Donetsk, recapture Kherson. You get the right bank of, 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 of Kherson as you come down through Mikolaev. You secure Zaporizhia. Uh, Ukraine's going to end up losing another 20, 25% of its territory by the time this done. Not because Russia started out that. As I said, Russia had no intention of doing this. This is what NATO caused. This is what happens when you give Ukraine $220 billion worth of military equipment and financial assistance to take on the Russians. When you do that, you sacrifice Ukraine. Ukraine is a strategically defeated nation. We're looking at not just military disaster, and a political disaster. Zelensky is going down the drain. Um, there's talk right now. I mean, you see an open break. And, and again, Larry, you... you, you I'm sure you were involved in teaching foreign, um, you know, foreign officers and such. What's the first thing we tell foreign officers? The importance of civilian control of the military, that there's right. important, we balance civil military relations. Well, in Ukraine, it's broken, ladies and gentlemen. Zelensky's spying on his commander in chief. Zelensky is actively, uh, you know, Going going behind Zeluzhny, trying to bring him down. Zeluzhny is getting involved in politics. This ain't going to end well. I actually, I'm, I'm loathe for very specific predictions, but I am predicting that if this situation doesn't get resolved, there will be a coup sometime in January, February, and Zelensky will go the way of Nicholas Ceausescu. He will be running through a, a backyard someplace, 
begging and they're just going to gun him down and kill him because he's done. He's finished. He's, he's delusional. The press conference he gave was you could have taken Adolf Hitler and imagine him giving a press conference in April of 1945, um, moving armies around, mobilizing 500,000. None of it exists because the Russians have already kicked your butt. They're coming in, taking Berlin. Russia's kicked the Ukraine's butt. They're coming in. They're taking it. Z Zelensky is insane. Um, but that's what uh, Blinken. And again, Larry, you're hundred percent right. I think the Russians go to bed every night praying yeah. and that, <laughs> that, that America has such geniuses like Tony Blinken, Lloyd Austin, Jake Sullivan, and Joe Biden. I mean, that, that quad right there is a guarantee of Russian strategic defeat, not just of Ukraine, but of NATO and also of the United States. And as an American, I don't like my country being strategically defeated, but man, we, we sort of earned this one. Larry, I want to bring you back in. You recently wrote in your Substack, Ukraine turned the lights out. The party is over. You showed the Washington Post moving the war in Ukraine to the <laughs> top hand side, almost as if it's uh, just another topic. It's no longer special. Well, they took it. Uh, they, actually, they they removed it so that oh, they the removed top it image together. shows oh. you. You see the banner where it says oh, war in Ukraine? Yes, yes, yes. Let's look at this closely. They, they come down to the next one, which was oh, the it's gone. Day. Okay. They took it out. So, well. you know, when the Washington Post is saying, uh, okay, we no longer need to do that, because if you click on those links anymore, uh, the, the stories that are coming up are not all the happy stories, you know, about uh, right. uh, fireworks and potato salad and summer picnics. Uh, grim tidings are are at hand mm. that, uh, you know, l let's put it in perspective. Do you know how large the active duty U.S. Army is, manpower-wise? I don't expect you to know, but it's 472,000. So think about that. Zelensky's claiming he can create an army bigger than the U.S. Army in the next six months. That's what Scott pointed out. That's crazy talk. That that's the cocaine talking. Okay, you, you know he's uh, he, he is out of touch with reality. Um, and what what Americans are not paying attention to, uh, particularly members of Congress, legislators, is that w while Russia may have started off the special military operation at a numerical disadvantage to the U.S. military. That's no longer the case. You know, as Scott noted earlier, uh, the, the Russians have, since January 1st, have brought in an average of 41,250 new recruits every month. So they're on track in one year to do over 480,000 soldiers for the Army, which it's going to boost then their total military strength to 1.3 million. Uh, as far as the army goes, well, that's bigger than than the U.S. Army if you count in National Guard and Army Reserve, et cetera. So right now, Russia, with a you know half our population, has got a larger army in place. And then when you factor in Navy, Air Force assets, Russia is going to be up around 2.2 million, which is uh, nine you know well well in excess of what the United States uh, can field. So, you know, Russia's getting ready. Now, the, they had the unanticipated uh, benefit of the special military operation. I don't think at the outset they had any idea that they would be demilitarize NATO. But that's exactly what's happened. They've exposed it. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the U.S. military is in real trouble across the board, not just the army. Uh, I discovered this week, I didn't realize it, but that in, in the early 90s, the United States got rid of all of its ship and submarine tenders. These, these supply ships that follow along behind Navy columns, uh, convoys, and that when, the, when a destroyer fires off all of its missiles, then that supply ship can come up alongside and pass those missiles off. United States got rid of all those in the early 90s, thanks to Bill Clinton. And guess what? All these destroyers we've got off in the Red Sea, they got a, they've got 90, uh, each, each destroyer has about 90 missiles. 
They fire those. There's no more. You know, it's not like they can call up uh, FedEx or Amazon and say, hey, you know, I'd like to like to put in an order for a thousand uh, Aegis uh, missiles. You know, because those babies only cost two million dollars a pop. And and the Yemenis are shooting it off at two thousand dollars a drone. <laughs> so, well, where did we first discover this thing? In Ukraine, where the Ukrainians can't make any shells or even enough to keep them themselves supplied. And the United States all of a sudden discovered it had trashed its industrial capability. So now there is no way to supply shells, artillery shells, 155 millimeter, 152 millimeter to Ukraine. And then the law of mathematics kicks in. If you If Russia can fire eight shots to every one shot that Ukraine does, Russia has about an eight times greater chance of inflicting casualties. It's like, you know, Scott used to be a boxer. So if we stood up and I say, okay, Scott, I'm going to hit you once. Then he says, okay, but I'm going to hit you eight times. I wouldn't be standing at the end, okay? <laughs> I might not even make it past the second punch. So th 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 that's where this uh, brings in the whole issue of casualties and, and manpower losses. There, there is no army in the world that can be hit with that kind of disadvantage and firepower like Ukraine has been pummeled that can emerge from that with, you know, intact, uh, not too many dead and wounded. Uh, it's just just the opposite. So, you know, the, the, the truth is finally coming out and all of these different um, newspapers are starting to report it, not just the Washington Post, the New York Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Uh, what was really sort of funny is the New York Times did this piece of talking about how Ukraine was was kidnapping guys off the streets. Oh man, this is this is shocking. Dude, that was happening 18 months ago. <laughs> you know. Scott was talking about it. I was talking about it. You know, we write, wrote about it. But now they're just discovering that, you know, it's like that scene from Casablanca. Gambling in a casino? <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I mean, the situation has indeed changed quite dramatically, uh, even just in the last year. And, uh, you know, I know Scott gave his predictions, Larry. I don't know if you have any predictions for 2024 about where this conflict is heading, because it seems, as you all both noted, uh, very different from how uh, maybe Blinken and uh, these uh, neocon psychopaths see it in their heads or like to portray it to be, even if they, they might know better uh, in private. The, their public face is a lot different. What what? Uh, do you have any predictions? Well, I think the possibilities for rapid deflation are, you know, very high. Um, I, I'll, be, you know, I'll be surprised if Zelensky makes it to to January first to New Year's. Um, the 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 kind of uh, political turmoil and, and and manipulation and maneuvering that's going on is significant. And I always learned, you know, as an old Latin American analyst, uh, spent a lot of time in Central America, always bet on the guys with the guns when it comes to coups. You know, all Zelensky's good at is, you know, playing the piano with one of the his appendages. You know, that doesn't help you when the guys coming down the hallway got rifles and guns. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's actually like that scene from the, do you see the movie Death of Stalin? It was a, it was out uh, two, three years ago. It's hilarious. And uh, at one moment, at one scene, the guy that plays Zhukov, General Zhukov, comes in and, and one of uh, Stalin's ki kids is Malvin off and he just whomps him in the face, punches him and he's down. And and then they, they uh, take out Beria later. You know, they got the guns on him. Well, Beria may have been an evil monster, but uh, Zhukov and boys had the guns. That's what's going to happen to Zelensky. He's he's not uh, he'll be lucky to survive this uh, to see if he like, winds up in any of his other properties. I I do hear some of these analysts people talk about that this war's at a stalemate, which means they don't know the definition of stalemate. They've never played chess. Uh, that this could drag on for two or three years, and I'm going what? 
you know, United States is not going to be writing that check. Sorry. And once the once Uncle Uncle Sugar starts sending over the sweetener, uh, Ukraine is done. Uh, they got enough for a week or two. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm. Uh, I think we'll see an end to this thing by by next summer. And uh, uh, maybe you can get Scott back in here, uh, and you can comment on this too, Larry. Given that we are reflecting on the uh, year that's transpired and the year that's coming for Ukraine and this conflict, uh, how has this conflict, Scott, uh, changed the world situation, the world order? Because the ramifications for the conflict, uh, as we've been discussing, as both of you are discussing, extend far beyond uh, what's happening on the battlefield. So, Scott, if you had, a, if you have a, a comment on that. Well, I think if we take a look at, um, I mean, I mean, Larry's already touched upon this, the uh, the disarmament of NATO. It's not just the disarmament of NATO from a physical standpoint. Um, NATO has lost all credibility. I mean, NATO lived off of the perception that it was this giant alliance with full of these modern armies with this modern equipment. And those Russians wouldn't dare mess with NATO because NATO had leopard tanks. NATO had M1 tanks and Challenger tanks. And, you know, we, NATO had stuff. Um, and it turns out that that stuff is garbage. Um, it also turns out that Na NATO armies are useless. Uh, I mean, Germany, for instance, has been exposed as nothing, literally nothing but a bunch of, you know, schnitzel eating, beer chugging, fat men who can't fight. They can't pass a physical fitness test. Uh, they can't, they haven't maintained any of their equipment. They are talking about, Germany's talking about putting together a 5,000 man brigade in Lithuania to reinforce the uh, 1,500 battalion that they have in there. <laughs> Except they don't have any tanks. You know, they're like, well, we'll send the brigade, but the, we, 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 we don't have, and we can't make tanks. Their, their industrial capacity has been diminished because of sanctions, because of the, the whole energy thing and, you know, they're now paying three times as much for energy. Their factories are shutting down. They don't have any, uh, you know, forges working. They're not producing the steel, the aluminum or anything. So they can't make the tanks they need to build this magical army that they're talking about producing. Uh, when was the last time a German soldier actually put 90 pounds on his back, force marched 25 miles and did a military task at the end under pressure? Never. Um, they just sit there. They're, they're a peacetime army of men who don't want to be there. Uh, I, what I mean by that is they can't get a job anywhere else. The good mechanics aren't in the German army. They're working for Mercedes. They're working for Audi. They're working for somebody else. Uh, the physically fit guys are playing sports. They're not doing this. The German army isn't, you know, a, a, a it's not a patriotic service because the Germans have forgotten what it means to be patriotic. Uh, so they have a military of, of, of men who aren't good at anything. Uh, they're definitely not good at fighting. And the German army ha has already admitted that uh, there's nothing that can stop the Russians from reaching the Oder River if they wanted to reach the Oder River. The good news for NATO is Russia doesn't want to do any of that. All Russia wants to do is be Russia. And this is the other thing that's happened here um, because Russia has redefined itself. I don't know if anybody picked up on, you know, the, the statements made earlier this year uh, by Putin and by Lavrov about the, you know, Russia's new foreign policy. And it's hinged on two things, the issue of Russian sovereignty and the issue on, on uh, Russian, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not sustainability, but self-reliance. So basically, Russia, when Russia started the special military operation, their economy was woven in with the West. And, and Russians still had this inferiority complex about, uh, well, you know, everything's better in New York, everything's better in Berlin, everything's better in Paris. Larry, you were just in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Everything ain't better in all these other cities. Moscow is pretty damn good. Right. Um, and Russia is pretty good. I, I was in other parts of Russia in, you know, the, the cities that aren't heralded, uh, Novosibirsk, Yerkutsk, Ekaterinburg, um, Izhevsk, Vodkensk. Um, they're doing okay too. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're doing, Russia's doing okay. It's not perfect. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. I mean, Moscow's damn close to being perfect, but Russia is, you know, it's got issues. 
Hell, they were in the 1990s. Russia was a destroyed economy, a destroyed society. Yeah. It's you know, Putin has been rebuilding them for 23 years successfully. But that thing that came out of this conflict is Russia has divorced itself from the West. They are done with the West. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they'll never be friends with the West. They will, but Russia will never again allow the West to be in a position where re Russia will be reliant upon them. Those days are over. This is a new Russia. This is a Russia that has said that Russia will never again be subordinated to the West culturally either. The day that the Russians go, oh, those French have better culture than us, is over. Russia has now said we are one of the major civilizations of the world, one of the major cultures of the world. This has been a, you know, the, the, a paradigm shift in terms of Russia's approach to interacting with the world. This is the big thing. Defeating Ukraine was automatic. Russia was always going to defeat Ukraine. You know, the, the timing of it and how that was going to happen, you know, could be flicks. The defeat of NATO was never intended. That's NATO's fault for get jumping in. But the redefinition of Russia is the biggest story here because Russia now will never back down. And there's a reason why the United States and Europe wanted to break Russia up at the end of the Soviet Union, because Russia is a huge landmass with a whole bunch of potential a whole bunch of potential. And when you combine that landmass and that potential, you create a problem that the West can't contain. So we wanted to break it up. That's over now. Russia is united. Russia is whole. And they 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 will emerge as, you know, one of the top three powers. I mean, they are already, you know, the top three powers, but they are going to be, you know, I, I remember how, you know, everybody uh, talked about, you know, Russia's just a, you know, a, a gas station with a nuclear weapon. Yeah, Blinken, Biden, they've all said it. Yep. McCain. Well, Russia ain't McCain. a gas station. Russia's, uh, Russia is one of the most diverse, culturally diverse, um, one of the most intellectually advanced, and one of the most industrially advanced. And I'll leave it at this. All the revolutions that are taking place right now on the battlefield, to give you an example, Ukrainian airplanes started dropping out of the sky where they never dropped out of the sky before. And the Ukrainians are going, what the hell happened? Well, see, Russia sat there and watched and listened. And in less than a year, was able to develop a weapon that could be fired and enter the in, into the supposed safe zone without the Ukrainians detecting it and taking out their planes. Because Russia doesn't have a defense industry that's about gouging the taxpayer. The Russian defense industry receives impetus from the field, inputs from the field, adapts and develops and then deploys and then perfects. And the Russian weapons today are all being fine-tuned to destroy Western weapons. Meanwhile, we're still putting out crap that breaks, crap that doesn't work. Um, we haven't refined anything. Larry, do you think the U.S. Army has developed a, a, a drone doctrine that has a uh, you know, FPV drones at the uh, at the company level uh, maneuvering with with no. no <laughs> and if you no. ain't doing that, you're going to lose a lot of guys because that's the new face of war. And if they're you don't have to, your drone capability, you're going to lose too. Yeah, no, they're they're starting to wake up to it. But it, uh, you know, there's I'm not even sure. You know, uh, I I spent 23 years scripting uh, terrorism exercises for JSOC, and so these were. Uh, these involve terrorist scenarios every uh, in all corners of the world, everything from nuclear to chem bio uh, and uh, conventional uh, terrorism. And we always had this process at the end, a hot wash, which was called lessons learned. And what I can say after all that time is nobody learned a damn thing. There were no lessons learned. There were needed and never learned. Now, I want to go back to something that Scott said that I just, just to put a, a exclamation mark on it. 43 years ago, when I was teaching at American University while trying to do a PhD, uh, I took a group of students down to the Russian embassy. And I, we met, I think, with uh, either the deputy chief of mission or the political secretary. At that time, you the, the Soviets, when these guys were Russian, they were insecure and they showed their insecurity. By being by bragging, being over you know would overstate things, and it was, I mean, it, it was so evident that they doubted themselves, and that was the period when you know blue jeans would be a big thing in Moscow, and 
the first McDonald's, I think, got opened in like 76, 77. Uh, why that's important is I stayed four blocks from that uh, McDonald's restaurant. It's no longer a McDonald's. Gone. And the dealing with Russians, I dealt with uh, someone from the foreign minister, foreign ministry, uh, a very senior official. The confidence they have, the maturity they have, the calmness they have is really something that's it's, it's, it's enviable. You wish we had that in the United States. And I've, uh, I've, I'm not kidding when I say that the United States is in the process of recreating itself into the Soviet Union, the old one, while Russia is in the prospe- process of making itself into sort of the powerhouse that the United States was in the 1950s uh, because they're excelling across the board. And I think the one temptation Russia will have to avoid is what has d- helped destroy America, that as long as you go outside and get keep getting involved in foreign conflicts, Steve, keep butting your nose into other the affairs of other countries, keep spending all of your taxpayer dollars on these foreign wars, you bankrupt your country in the process. And as Scott correctly noted, you go to Moscow and everything's up to date. It's beautiful. Uh, they don't have, like in San Francisco, you can get an app which shows you where all the human beings have defecated on the sidewalks. Uh, they don't have poop mats and poop mats in uh, in Moscow. Uh, it, you know the streets are clean. It's big snow. People are out shoveling snow, and they got a they got machines that work it and, and get it picked up. So you know, like Scott said, it's not a perfect place, but they've at least spent their money on making Russia great again, and that's you know that it, it really has happened there. And and what's so frustrating is in the United States, in any politician, any political leader that tries to speak positively about Russia and why we should be friends with them is attacked, vilified, uh, accused of being some sort of uh, puppet of Putin. And uh, what I'm afraid of is we're, it's going to take us getting a bloody nose knocked on our ass before we may wake up and say, you know, maybe we need to talk to the Russians. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, it certainly is a, a, a new McCarthyism, so to speak, uh, era here in the United States. And I wanted to get maybe your final comments uh, before we move on to something, uh, another topic. On uh, when I, I asked about the global ramifications of the Ukraine conflict, one of the things that's been going on is uh, Zelensky's last. Uh, presser the one that you referenced uh that you both referenced uh he 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 sounded quite down about nato membership but in recent weeks there's been all of this hype on potential eu membership and <laughs> <laughs> and oh, it almost sounds oh. as if this uh, concession of just talking about ukraine's possible eu membership is is just another reflection of the uh, uh, strategic defeat, this uh, rot that is this project Ukraine. Um, maybe I'll let you and Scott first, and then Larry to uh, comment on it. Has everybody seen that movie Rudy? Yeah, you know it's very wonderful. You all are more I mean, culture than me. <laughs> this, yeah, this, Rudy, this, this, you know, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. You know, and he's he's basically this this small kid. I mean, he's got a lot of motivation, but he wants to play football for Notre Dame. And he walks on and he spends every year he goes out there and he's on the, the practice squad and and nothing. And they they let him suit up in the end his senior year, but he's not gonna play because he's he's not very good. He doesn't he, he really doesn't qualify to do any of this stuff. But he gets in at the end. It's a happy ending. Ukraine is the story of Rudy with no happy ending. Yeah. Okay. The crowd can be shouting Rudy, 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 but what's really going on is they're getting Rudy's hopes up. And the coach just says, no, nope, don't send him in, nothing, sit on the bench. Not just sit on the bench, but get him the hell off the field, get him in the locker room. Ukraine will never be a member of the European Union. It doesn't qualify. Nobody in Europe really wants it to be. This is one of these stupid political ploys that's put out there. And I don't know why the Ukrainians and the Georgians, because the Georgians have been given the same thing. You can be a member of the EU. No, you can't, Georgia. You don't qualify. The EU is an economic union. 
um, not just a political union, but an economic union, which means you got to sort of have a sound economy before you can be invited in. Ukraine isn't just a, a, a body on life support. It's dead. I mean, it's there ain't nothing there. You can you can put oxygen mask on it, put an IV in. You ain't going to recover that. The Ukraine only exists when we give it money. They don't have a viable economy now. You heard Zelensky in his, in his conference about I need you know six working Ukrainians to pay taxes to pay for one soldier. Um, so in the way, who's going to give me those jobs? Because they don't have any jobs in Ukraine. They got nothing in Ukraine. Um, so there will ne- Ukraine will never be a member of the EU. I don't know how to say that any clearer than this. This is one of those sick things that we did with Ukraine to lure them into believing that, you know, A, they could be a member of NATO. No, no, I said when that is, they don't qualify to be NATO. They will never be a member of NATO, ever. Well, I think everybody recognizes that now. So now they're putting out that last bit of hope. You know, you can be a member of the EU. We'll fast track you into what? Fast track into what? Membership? No, this is the talks. We're fast tracking you into talks, which means we're going to drag it up. This is part of this is like watching a cat play with a mouse before it eats it. It's just sad, but it's 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 Rudy with no happy ending. Hey, remember that uh, Turk, the EU voted to let Turkey in too. The accession talks. That's about 21, 22 years ago. They're still waiting. It took Ireland. Think about this. Ireland, I mean, a bunch of like to drink a bit. You know, took them 20 years to get in. So, <laughs> you know, the notion that Ukraine's going to be bum-rushed through the door, you know, that's not happening. Yeah, but the other, you, you know, I think Russia was surprised by the special military operation on several fronts. One, you know, the weakening of the weakening and potential destruction of NATO is one. But then it really gave the impetus for BRICS and the rise of, of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, creating an alternative economic system outside of the, you know, U.S. dollar denominated reserve system. Uh, and, and we're seeing, you know, this week the United States thinks it's being cute that, oh, we're going to pass a law and we're going to take that $300 billion that we stole from Russia. We're going to give it to Ukraine. Boy, that'll be a game changer for them. <laughs> yeah, it, it might mean that, you know, Zelensky can buy more cocaine. OK, but um, apart from that, that it's what the message it sends to the rest of the world is. If we do business in U.S. dollars, this United States can take our money anytime they want. And there, there's nothing we can do about it. So why would we want to get ourselves hooked into that kind of system when we can join BRICS and deal in our own currency? And so it's a fundamental change in the international economic order, the, 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 the new world order created in the wake of World War II, with the International Monetary Fund, the Bretton Woods Agreement, the World Bank, the United Nations, all of that's coming apart. And the traditional U.S. leadership in that is crumbling. It's being dramatically eroded. And that's what one of the things I think Russia awakened, you know, it awoke to. It realized, as Scott said earlier, we don't need these guys. We're, we're our own person. We can do our own thing. Now, if, if to that point, if we want to have a relationship with them, we'll do that. But, uh, you know, they're sort of like this uh, spouse in an abusive relationship that's realized, hey, I can get away from the wife beater and I don't have to put up with that crap anymore. Yeah. Hey, yes, indeed. I mean, the the world has changed quite dramatically since February 2022, but even in, in the last year. Uh, Larry, you were just in Russia. I know, Scott, you've been. Um, we're talking about economic growth in Russia despite these sanctions. I mean, the massive number of sanctions, uh, 2023 seems to be the year where it has become very clear. If it wasn't clear in 2022, it is very clear in 2023 that three and a half, uh, everything. Three and a half percent. Three and a half yeah. percent growth right now in Russia. Growth. It's incredible. I have a, I video, mean, I have, I have a video from a friend of mine who... Um, 
was at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum earlier this summer. And he, he was walking around and he just sends this video and he's showing all the, the pavilions and everything. And then he just turns and he goes, thank you, Joe Biden. Because <laughs> I mean, it's the greatest success that out there. Um, it, it, the, these sanctions have just backfired like you wouldn't believe it. What Again, Larry knows this. Danny, you know this well. I ain't an economist, okay? I'm a very simple guy. I'm not, you know, one of these uh, gee whiz, you know, McNamara's gee whiz guys that's good with numbers and all that stuff. But in December of 2021, I wrote an article that said, if they try to sanction Russia, it will backfire and be the end. Because I know enough about gas stations to know that if you've got a big old, you know, Humvee that chugs diesel, um, you need a gas station that sells diesel um, at an affordable price. And um, Europe was this big old Humvee that chugs diesel, and Russia supplied the diesel. And by sanctioning Russia, they cut off the diesel supply. And now the Humvee's out of fuel. It don't work. It's sitting in the corner rusting, falling apart because there's no spare parts. Um, a Marine can understand that. You don't have to be an economist to understand that. Europe shot itself in the foot with these sanctions. Russia, meanwhile, was liberated from the oligarchs. Um, they're, all the money the oligarchs were taking out of Russia now stays in Russia, reinvested in Russia. Um, every city I went to, and, and Larry, I think Moscow was the same. It was that way in May? You probably saw cranes on the skyline. Yeah. Yeah. Building, 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 building. They, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a growth economy at a time when the West is still, I think the EU just passed their 14th round of sanctions or something like that. I mean, the first 13 were so good. They had to go to 14. It's ridiculous. Well, I mean, get, uh, the book that needs to be written is it'll be a short book uh, <laughs> where, where economic sanctions worked. Yeah. I, I, I would challenge anybody to cite me a single example in history where a country imposed economics, in particular economic sanctions, on another country, and it compelled that country to both either change its policies or change its political leadership, or both. Yeah, not a thing. I mean, the United States keeps trying it over and over and over, and what happens? Cuba, Iran. <laughs> You know, Venezuela Russia, Iraq. Looks strong yeah, Iraq. right now. Venezuela looks strong, and, yeah. and it's not a strong country <laughs> normally, but it is. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's changing. Syria so, too. Yeah. So I, you know, I was never asked to write this when I was at CIA, but you know, somebody said, "Hey, kid, give us an assessment. Can sanctions work?" And you, and I said, "It would be a pretty brief, succinct paper." No, they don't. Don't do it. Find something else. Well, sanctions is 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 it's not a policy. It's the lack of policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What say when when we impose sanctions, what we're saying is we don't know what to do, and so we're going to punt. We're going to put sanctions in place uh, to buy time to look like we're doing something while we do nothing. Meanwhile, all we do is end up isolating isolating ourselves further. Our strength came from the the fact that we dominated the global economic system. And the only way you continue to dominate is by having people buy into it, you know, right. and, then, and then they buy into it. And now you can, and if you're smart, you manipulate on the sidelines. You don't do the big thing because you want them to continue to buy into it. You want them to keep coming. You want them to keep signing up, get more subscribers, um, but manipulate on the sideline, control indirectly. And if you're clever, you own the whole world. No, we'll see. Politically, we can't do that because we have to have Marco Rubio and uh, you know uh, Ted Cruz and all these other idiots. Um, you know, we're strong. We're America. Uh, like Tony Blink. We, <laughs> I know we might get to China, but you know, we can only deal with China from a position of strength. Really? Um, how about just yeah. dealing with China? That would be nice. But the the point is, we screwed up because we sanctioned everybody, and they end up saying. Well, we don't want to play anymore. What do you think is going to happen, Larry, when they take $300 billion from Russia? Because yeah. up until now, we've had Janet Yellen and others say, we can't do that because that's illegal. Uh, yeah. And, and, and Russia is going to put, you know, Russia will take back the uh, loans that uh, U.S. companies were expected to be repaid. Russia will just confiscate. I mean, 
they got three hundred billion dollars worth of infrastructure in there. They'll just nationalize. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it, uh, it's foolish. And it also means that nobody's ever going to want the dollar again or the euro again, yeah. which is happening right now. That's what the whole impetus behind de-dollarization isn't that the dollar is a weak currency. Actually, the dollar on the international trade is a very strong currency. Uh, look at it. when you trade in the dollar, you don't have any of this messy currency exchange rates and this complication. Uh, things happen smoothly because everybody's using the same currency. How stupid were we to end that system? What we've done now, though, is make the dollar a, a, a suicide pill because now, you know, swift. I can't, you know, I can't do I'm a sovereign nation. I want to do something, but I can't now because my my dollars touch the or or a dollar I use touch the banking system. So now the U.S. government can going to tell me what to do. I mean, the, the arrogance of the Congress to say, if you touch a dollar, we own you. And then we say we want everybody to have their 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 you know fiscal their their reserves uh, in dollars and euros again because of the ease of commerce, and we we put them in banks so that things are convenient, things are fast, the transactions, and then we seize them, and people are going to go well you know I know it's inconvenient for me to trade with uh, renbin and 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 in, 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 uh, in rupees, but ain't nobody going to be seizing my money. Uh, America has basically. Navigated itself out of a winning position. We were controlling the world because we had a system in place that enabled us to control the world with very little effort. And we've thrown that away because of sanctions, this arrogance, et cetera. And the world will never go. BRICS, BRICS was a was a division three football team a, you know, a couple of years ago. They weren't very, you know, it was like BRICS, the potential of BRICS. Maybe someday they'll grow up. Bam, instant, instant adulthood. Not because BRICS suddenly you know blossomed, because America became such a bad option that everybody went, got anything else out there? BRICS. And look, BRICS had to grow up quick. The South Africa uh, summit they had. That was that was called rapid adulthood, where they had to come in. They talked about expanding. Russia's taking over BRICS on January 24th. They're going to expand and even expand more. They're off to the races now. Um Good job, America. Good job, Tony yep. Blinken. Well, you know, one other thing on this, that America really is like poked one of its eyes out when it uh, pushed Russia off swift. Because why, why is that? Well, if you're transacting in dollars, any transaction in dollars going through swift is going through the United States electronically, which means that NSA can pick that up and monitor every single transaction. <laughs> <laughs> so now what we've done is, a uh, well, we're not going to look any. We just po poked our eyes out, so Russia can go do, uh, <laughs> you know, if it was engaged with some skullduggery with its money, we're not going to see it now. And I mean, that's a, another self-inflicted wound. Just it just shows how stupid and short-sighted these people are. They just uh, they, they want to just do things. To, show you, to yeah, build on what Larry just said, um, tankers, old tankers. You know, Russia's <laughs> built this ghost fleet. I have to laugh about this because if you remember the arrogance, we're going to put a cap on Russian oil. Yeah. Really? Oh, they're doubling oh, yes. down on that. Supposedly, yeah. That's we're going to we're going to deny right. We're going to deny Russia insurance. Really? And you don't think Russia has a plan? So Russia went out and bought all the old tankers in the world, and they filled them up with oil. And and now we don't know because they bought them not with dollars. They bought them on the market, on a market that we don't control anymore. We have no clue how many tankers Russia has and is operating. We have no idea what's going on. All these people that used to run the, the world oil thing and, you know, oh, I can predict the price. You can't they, you know, because they don't know what Russia is doing. They have no clue what Russia is doing because half of what Russia is doing right now is being reported in channels that the NSA isn't collecting on anymore because we've, We've allowed Russia to unplug from the the known knowables. So we are. This this is my my frustration with people who are supposed to be experts in the energy security business. They haven't a clue about Russia. They don't know anything about Russia. They they claim they don't need to know anything about Russia. They don't want to know. And this is why Russia is running circles around us, because Russia knows everything about us. Russia 
is very knowledgeable about who we are and what we are. That's why Russia is so patient. Do you see any panic from Russia? Larry, did you see any panic? No, no panic. All the very There's nothing but panic in Washington, D.C. Nothing but panic. Why? Because they have no clue what's going on. They literally have no clue. All they'd have to do is pick up the phone and call the Russian ambassador, Anatoly Antonov, and talk. And he, he'd be more than happy to. But we don't allow anybody to engage with him. We've got nobody in State Department having connectivity with Moscow. I mean, Moscow used to have one of the biggest North American bureaus out there, you know, in the foreign in the foreign ministry. A whole bunch of experts on America who would pick up the phone and talk to their American counterparts when problems need to be solved. America hasn't made these phone calls, so they're redistributing these people. Um, and Russia doesn't care. Russia's like, you don't want to talk to us? That's okay. Chinese want to talk to us. Indians want to talk to us. Africa wants to talk to us. The whole world wants to talk to us. America doesn't want to talk to us. No problem. And suddenly now America's going, oh, we might want to talk to the Russians. I'm sorry. The party you're calling doesn't really want to talk to you ever again. You know, and that's the reality. We've blown it with Russia. We have truly blown it. Yes. Uh, on that note, uh, we can transition. Uh, for those in the audience, Make sure you're hitting that like button to get more people here. We have a great audience here of over 6,300 to hear Larry and Scott's uh, words of wisdom. But speaking of panic, let's move now to West Asia and zero in on Israel's, um, I guess we can call it onslaught on Gaza. And of course, this occurred in the last quarter of the year. Um, 2023, and uh, after October 7th, in Hamas's uh, operation uh, on October 7th, there has been a non-stop campaign of Israeli assault on Gaza. Just uh, over 20,000, I believe, Palestinians now killed, and uh, this has had huge ramifications. And I know, uh, Larry, you just penned a piece. I can pull it up. Uh, maybe if you give your reflections on what is going on here and what you feel like are some of those important points that we should be reflecting on as this, uh, uh, you know, conflict, war, genocide, as some are calling it, uh, uh, remains ongoing. Yeah. Well, let's start with the fact that Israel is lying about its objective in, uh, uh, in Palestinian territories. They're, they're not out to defeat Hamas. They can't defeat Hamas. What they're out to do is to expunge all Palestinians from territory they currently operate, that they that they live on. They want it's a, it's a form of genocide. It's a form of extermination. Um, the uh, the piece I wrote that you're showing right now, revisiting the October seventh Hamas attack, and and Scott er, early on was uh, right on top of this, pointing out that. Even though the Israeli propaganda machine kicked into overdrive almost immediately to portray this as some sort of blind rage attack by Hamas, that all they wanted to do was rape and kill and commit all sorts of heinous crimes, the, the reality was it was actually a pretty professional military operation on their part. Uh, they uh, the one goal was to attack military targets and kill. Israeli military personnel, which they did. They knocked out 72 of the Golani Brigade, which is, you know, the, uh, at least a highly uh, respected unit or was. Uh, and then uh, object number two, capture as many civilians as possible. That's why all those cars that were mangled, burned messes that are stacked up in a junkyard look like they do because Hamas had potential captives and hostages in them, and the Israeli Air Force blew those up, destroyed those. And then the, the news that's coming out, uh, every day more news about the fact that it was the Israeli military killing civilians on October 7th. It was not Hamas. Hamas was not deliberately targeting and killing civilians. That was the Israeli occupation force. Uh, they were doing that. And it's not, it's not coming from Hamas people saying that. It's coming from Israelis who were there and, and who witnessed it. And, and then people say, oh, how could that be? Well, we, we've seen over the last week when, when the Israeli army shot and killed two of its own people 
or three of its own people who had been hostages, who got away. They came out, no shirt on, naked, you know, naked from the waist up, waving a white flag, and it got shot. Two two separate Israeli soldiers shot it. So this was not the the fault of some knucklehead who just got a happy trigger finger. What this illustrates is that Israel has a shoot to kill against any Palestinian, armed or unarmed. And then, uh, you, you know what what's becoming apparent. I, I there was a time where I used to have some respect for the Israeli military. They're a dangerous clown show uh, across the board. That The fact that these soldiers are, don't have proper rules of engagement or the rules of engagement they have violate the rules of war, number one. They had this, they're had they not even good at their propaganda. They, they tried to create a propaganda video about it two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, where they got all these guys, these Palestinians lined up in their underwear, claiming they're Hamas, they're not. And this chubby guy comes out from behind. Now, they're in their underwear. He's in his underwear. He's got an AK rifle in his left hand and an empty magazine in his right hand. And he walks up and puts it down. First question is, how do you disrobe somebody and then give them a damn gun? Who does that? I, I queried one of my buddies tonight who's he served in Vietnam with the army. You know, and his his name is Larry too. I said, Hey Larry, when when you were going through basic training, didn't they didn't they instruct you that you first if you you know when you capture someone from North Vietnam, that you strip them to their underwear and then you hand them a gun, right? And he goes, No, of course not. But the best part of the story is that then you get another video, the same video it looks like, except this time the guy's got the rifle in his opposite hand, in his right hand, and the magazine's in the left hand. So they were staging this. And you got to step back and say, what amount of pot or narcotic were they on when they thought this up? Because it makes them look stupid. They are stupid for doing it. So uh, the entire point of my piece is just that um, what we've seen is a military that's out of control, that's unprofessional, that's poorly trained, that's poorly led, and they are wantonly killing civilians. Scott, if you want to jump in. I, I mean, literally, I think, you know, Larry Larry said it all. Look, the, the Israelis have a, you know, their policy is to commit genocide against the Palestinian civilians. Um, they have a doctrine, the Dahia doctrine, named after the West Beirut suburb that uh, they blew away in 2006 because Hezbollah kicked their butts on the battlefield. So they said, well, if we can't beat them militarily, we'll punish the civilians so much that they'll never allow Hezbollah to fight us again. <laughs> How's that working out, Israel? Um, you know, but then they implemented that repeatedly against the Palestinians. And uh, what we're seeing right now is basically Israel knows that it can't militarily defeat Hamas. I mean, I'm not on the battlefield, I, you know, uh, but I, I can just tell you that common sense dictates that when uh, an opponent that is well prepared as Hamas was, and Larry you know, pointed out, this attack on October 7th was one of the, the finest um, military raids, um, you know, conducted in modern history. Um, the intelligence uh, of the uh, in preparation, the training, the tactics of the, of Hamas were, uh, I mean, impeccable. They had fantastic intelligence. They knew what they wanted to do. They know who they wanted to do it to, where they needed to go. They knew the timings, uh, and they executed it. Um, then they came back. The reason why they took all those people hostage was to create bait, <laughs> and then you create so that Israel now has to come into. Your battlefield. Now, if you took all the time and effort to plan this October 7th event, do you think that, and you were trying to lure Israel in, do you think maybe that you had prepared this trap, that you were anticipating what Israel could do? Of course they did. They knew that Israel was going to bomb the living crap out of the above ground. That's okay from Hamas' perspective because, A, you create cities of rubble that now make it impossible for Israel to operate effectively. They should have learned that from, say, Stalingrad or you know, Monte Cassino. Um, but below ground, you have 500 kilometers of tunnels that aren't just haphazard. These tunnels have been thought out in advance. 
Um, majority of these tunnels don't terminate on the surface. If you take a look at the Hezbollah videos, when their guys are emerging, you'll see that they, they've had to open up the thing and clear out about six to eight feet of, um, of, 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 of earth to get, to get out of the tunnel. Why? Because the Israelis can't come in with some uh, basic, you know, uh, ground penetrating radar and detect it. And what happens here when Israel clears out their berm area where their guys are sitting in the middle resting with alleged security around, Hamas pops up right in the middle of it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Bap, 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 back down. Then they blow the tunnel so that it doesn't connect with anything. Hamas has prepared this battlefield for a decade. They know exactly what to do. There's no way this Israeli conscript force. Larry, what's the average age of an American Marine major? Uh, probably 32. Yeah, uh, not 23, though. Right, right. Okay, yeah. so you got these Israeli majors, majors, <laughs> field grade officers, 23. Uh, what's the average age of, say, um, I don't know, a, um, a staff sergeant? Yeah, about uh, 28, 29. But not 19. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what, what we got to understand is you have this army, this Israeli conscript army that is putting people in command positions. Look. When I was a captain, I was a pretty good Marine. I, you know, I'm not bragging, but I was okay. I was all right. But I have to tell you, every time somebody hit me with a problem, I went, Staff Sergeant, Gunny, come in here and educate the captain, please. And the only reason why I was really good is I had really good staff NCOs who backed me up, who kept me doing the right thing, who had didn't hesitate to come in and say, uh, Skipper, you don't want to do that. Uh, well, why not? Da, 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 da. Well, yeah, you're right. I don't want to do that. And Things work. Now, imagine a 19-year-old sergeant. A 19-year-old sergeant. That means he was conscripted at 18. <laughs> he's gone through a year of training, and now he's a sergeant. And he's going to be advising his 23-year-old major about what? All the experience he has, all the extensive combat. The Israeli army is a joke. It is a literal joke. They're, they're good at beating up. 10-year-old boys. They're good at raping uh, girls. They're good at murdering women. And that's all they're good at. They're not good at fighting. They're really not good at fighting. Russians who fought in Mariupol, fought in Bakhmut, are looking at the tactics that the Israelis are using uh, in Gaza and saying uh, they'd all die. If, if you took those Israelis and put them in Bakhmut or Mariupol, they'd all die. Now, I know that they're not fighting you know, a, a, a large a conventional army, but their tactics suck. They suck. And it's not just that they're bad soldiers. They're bad people. Now we come to what Larry talked about. They, The murder of those three Israelis proves that the Israeli army has shoot to kill orders. And you know what's interesting about that? It's a war crime, a literal war crime. You're not allowed to do this. But they do it. They have a, a doctrine called the gospel, or not a doctrine, but a plan called the gospel plan, the Hasbara plan. Um, it's AI generated. They've broken Gaza down into, you know, target packages determined by a computer that says when you drop a bomb on here, this is how many civilians you kill. Why the hell do you need to know how many or predict how many civilians you kill? And then you drop the bomb anyways, because your whole purpose is to kill civilians. That's what the Israelis are doing right now. And here's the sickest part. Joe Biden has given them a green light to kill as many Palestinians as they can up until the end of the year. And that's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Not because Israel thinks they can defeat Hamas. They can't. They know Hamas is going to survive this conflict. What they're trying to do is terrorize the Palestinian people so much that when this is over, the Palestinian people will never let Hamas do on October 7th again. And it's going to backfire because the Palestinian people have rallied around Hamas like they've never rallied behind them before. If there was an election today in Palestine, Hamas would win across the board. 76% support right now. That's amazing. Um, you, can't, you can't destroy them militarily. Politically, you've empowered them, and the Palestinian people are behind them. This has backfired like you wouldn't believe on Israel. And Israel's suffering what I call a strategic defeat right now. And if they're not careful, um, you know, the, the whole solution was always, a, you know, the, the, the solution, the, the school book solution was always a two-state solution. Everybody talked about two-state solution. Oslo was premised on two-state solution. Well, Netanyahu has just admitted that he was never going to let that happen. He's been sabotaging it from, from day one. 
and the Israeli behavior right now, no one can ever trust Israel again. Israel has destroyed its reputation. Uh, it is a disgusting, despicable, genocidal regime that will never change. The day of Yitzhak Rabin is over. He was assassinated by a Netanyahu supporter, and Israel has fundamentally changed. I think Israel's talked itself into a one-state solution, and it ain't the one that Israel thinks it, it wants to have. Because I, I honestly believe what Israel's done is guarantee that in a decade there won't be an Israel. There'll be a Palestine. Jews will be welcome to live in there. But you'll find that when the Palestinian state is created, that many of these Zionists will flee because they don't want to live in peace with Palestinians. They are what I call the Brooklyn Jew class. And I don't mean that there's nothing anti-Semitic in that. Brooklyn Jews, that's it, class of people uh, who feel free to fly into Israel uh, and go to the West Bank and murder people and steal their homes and steal their land. And when confronted about it, they say, eh, that's... It's so what we get to do. The courts back us up. The soldiers are there. These are Americans who go to Israel to murder Palestinians and steal their land. Um, they aren't going to stay in Israel. They're going to try and come back to America. I'd like to believe that we pass laws that say you're not welcome back here. You're on your own. But um, it's over for Israel. I think Israel has talked itself out of existence. That's the the real implication of this of this fight. You know, if you uh, if you went back to October fifth. And you had done a survey of the Arab Muslim countries in the Middle East. <coughs> You'd find that Hamas was not very popular in Egypt. Hamas was not popular, not much support in Saudi Arabia at all. Ditto for Jordan and for Turkey. What Israel has done in the last three months is they've turned Hamas into a sympathetic figure or at least one that the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Jordanians, and the Turks have to pay attention to. If, if for no other reason, just to placate the, the guy in the street that's really upset by what they're seeing Israel do to the Palestinian uh, civilians. So it has actually made Hamas stronger. That's the irony of this. It's made Hamas stronger, not weaker. And, mm. you know, Israel's got this, in their mind, they think that they can always kill their way out of something. And it's like they decided, I think it wasn't it, Netanyahu just announced that, that maybe they were going to do like Munich too. You know, in the aftermath of the Munich Olympics, they, they sent out hit teams to kill all the perpetrators. Well, you know, number one, it was basically a failure as a mission because the, they killed a waiter up in New, Norway who wasn't even involved, had nothing to do with it. And uh, they didn't get them all. And when the operation was over, it didn't stop the terrorist attacks. And so, I mean, the, the goal of using force is ultimately to stop the attack. You know, I, I'm a firearms trainer and I teach people, you never draw your gun and point it at someone unless your life is in imminent danger. And then if you have to point your gun and fire, fire, but make sure you stop the threat. Once the threat's over, got back in the holster. Well, Israel's never learned that. Uh, they've, uh, you know, the, this policy of killing civilians is, is it's going to cost them. I, I, you know, it's bad when a friend of mine, she's Jewish, she's a daughter of a Holocaust survivor, and I was at her house two nights ago. They had had sort of a holiday party, and she comes up to me and whispers. She goes, "I'm watching what's going on over there," and. The Israelis are doing to the Palestinians what the Nazis did to my mother. You know it's bad when you got a Jewish lady who's a Holocaust survivor who's making that comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, if you could, and Scott, maybe I can have you come back in here, the ramifications of what Israel is doing has obviously spilled over well beyond uh, the Gaza was called an enclave, uh, but that that part of Palestinian territory, and now there is uh, increasing tensions around the Red Sea, with uh, Yemen's Ansar Allah uh, getting really deep in uh, waging a blockade <coughs> that's been pretty successful to this point um, in response to what's happening in Gaza. But of course, there's more with Hezbollah, and uh, there have been. I, I feel like there's been more and more tensions regionally 
And Israel is talking about trying to get the U.S. to help them push Hezbollah back along the border. Uh, help us make sense of the regional ramifications and where this is going as we enter 2024. Well, first of all, let's reflect back on um, Nasrallah's uh, speech that he gave, I think, on October 9th, two days after. Um, and I call it the escalation management speech uh, and because and, everybody's expecting Hezbollah to jump in and, and join the fight. And Hezbollah basically said, "We're our, we're we're in, but our way. We're going to do it our way. We're not going to do it. Uh, we're not going to do it that way. Because how is Israel going to be strategically defeated here? Israel set the parameters of victory, being the destruction of Hamas. I think Larry and I agree. Hamas is won. They they're not going to be destroyed. So Israel's already lost this war. Plus, if you're Hezbollah, your goal is the creation of a Palestinian state." So the law, you've got to keep the whole world's focus on that problem set, and it's working against Israel. The whole world is rallied behind it. The last thing you want to do is expand this conflict because now suddenly the Palestinian issue is not the only issue. In fact, it's going to be put on the back burner as you deal with bigger regional issues like war with Iran. That's a bigger problem set than the Palestinian issue. So you don't want to expand this conflict. So you've seen a lot of escalation management, but it's been done very cleverly. Uh, Hezbollah, for not wanting to get involved, has tied down one, one half of the Israeli Navy, one third of the Israeli Air Force, one quarter of the Israeli Army. They forced 70,000 people to be displaced out of northern Israel, uh, putting a huge burden on the Israeli economy. And they're just humiliating the Israelis on a daily basis on the border. And um, the, here's the thing. You think Hamas has tunnels. Hezbollah has tunnels. Better tunnels. Deeper tunnels longer tunnels. You know that tunnel that the Israelis dug up? It's amazing, right at the, I think it's the Eretz crossing. And suddenly 400 meters from the crossing, how far along and we have 70 some odd days in this conflict. And they go, oh my God, the biggest tunnel imaginable that you can literally drive a car through is right here. Wait a minute, you, you guys didn't find that tunnel until now? Um, that tunnel is small compared to the tunnels that Hezbollah has carved into uh, northern Israel. When the time comes, Hezbollah will seize northern Israel. There's nothing the Israelis can do to stop it. They will take uh, Kiryat Shimona. They will take other towns. They will take the Galilee. Israel can't stop them. But Hezbollah doesn't want to do that right now. Hezbollah has let it be known that they can do that, and they will do that if called upon. And this is why you're seeing Israel hesitate, because you've got all the chest-thumping guys saying, we need to go in and kick Hezbollah's butt. Israel proved that they can't kick Hezbollah's butt. They tried it in 2006. didn't work. Hezbollah has gotten even better. They've become combat hardened uh, with you know, a, a decade plus experience in Syria. Um, so Hezbollah, there's nothing the United States can do. What you think American pilots and American airplanes dropping American bombs are going to do a better job than Israeli pilots and American airplanes dropping American bombs? Um, no. First of all, our pilots aren't that good anymore. We just don't train that well. Training is expensive. Um, you know, when was the last time we did a real honest to God, uh, you know, air attack against somebody with an integrated air defense or somebody has the potential of doing that? Yeah. Not in a long time. Our pilots don't know how to fight. And so we'd be going through a learning curve that'd be unreal. And then we'd get humiliated because it's not stopping anything. Um, and you think Americans, when, when Hezbollah moves into northern Israel, you think Americans are going to drop bombs on Kiryat Shimona? You think Americans are going to drop bombs on Israel? Ain't going to happen. See, Hezbollah isn't going to sit in southern Lebanon and let the fight come to them. Hezbollah is going to take the fight to northern Israel. And now the Israelis are going to have to bomb their own cities, bomb their own people. America will stay out of that fight because we are not going to bomb Israel. Hezbollah's thinking. They know this. If I know this, Israel knows this. America knows this. That's why I'm not too worried about an expansion of the fight, because Israel knows they'll just get, I was going to use a bad word, they'll get beat up. Um, now we come to the Houthi. You know, this is very rude of me, uh, but every time when I, when, I, when I think of the Houthi, I just think of, you know, some, some wild dudes from Mad Max, you know. <laughs> you know, just yelling charge and go. Because they just sort of, on October 19th, they just appeared. The Houthi just woke up and said, screw it, launch. And everybody's like, what the heck just happened? The Houthi just fired on Israel. 
Did that really happen? Who do you know? Hell yeah, that happened. We're going to do it again. Launch, launch, launch. And then, then they say, screw it. Take a ship. Fly helicopters out there. Take everybody go, what the hell's going on? Where are the hoodie doing? And then the hoodie just say, we're going to shut it all down. And they have. They've effectively closed the, 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 the man, uh, I can't, I can't say the word, uh, the man el Bob uh, Straits. Um, that little narrow piece of water between Yemen and, and Djibouti. <laughs> you know, they've shut it down. The Red Sea, you can't go to the Suez Canal right now because the Houthi have shut it down. And now America's going, what do we do? So we've, we're moving a fleet down and we're realizing we can't do anything. Now, the big news isn't that America can't beat the Houthi. I mean, we can't. Um, and we're not going to. to. To to secure those straits, we'd have to put 40,000 Marines on the ground. We don't have 40,000 Marines to put on the ground. We can't get 40,000 Marines there. And once we get them on the ground, we can't sustain it. There's 100,000 plus Houthi out there. We ain't going to beat them. Saudi Arabia has been trying since 2014 using American planes with American bombs, using American intelligence. Hasn't worked. The Houthi can destroy Saudi Arabia's oil production capacity. That's one big thing here that's causing everybody to hit pause on that. Saudi Arabia is like, um, you guys are going to do what to the Houthi? Pause, 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 please pause, because they're going to blow up the Aramco oil fields, and we don't want that to happen. Um, the United Arab Emirates going, wait a minute, you're going to do what? No, no, we don't want to have anything with that either. Pause, 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 because they don't want to lose their oil production capacity either. So America's sitting there going, hmm. But here's the big story. It's not about that straight. You know how America has been saying for decades, we guarantee that the Strait of Hormuz will be open, that Iran will never shut it down, that if Iran ever tries to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, the American Fifth Fleet will keep it open. That's just been proven to be a lie Yeah, because we yeah. can't beat the Houthi and we damn sure aren't going to beat the Iranians. What this proves is that America's fleet, all of its you know dozen you know aircraft carrier battle groups can't do anything. Yeah. So it's a waste of money, total waste of money. We have to be careful about getting sunk, losing a carrier. Um, as Larry said, you know, I'm an American taxpayer. Okay. So I got the USS Carney out there, you know, the Aegis class, uh, you know, Arleigh Burke class uh, destroyer. It's got 90 missiles, SM2s, SM6s, other things out there. And each one of them runs between $1.1 and $4 million each, depending on which missile you use. The Houthi have thousands of these drones and cheap missiles. They cost them $2,000, $5,000, maybe ten dollars for the good stuff. And the Houthi are just sitting there, again, oh, the guy from Mad Max, oh, and they're going to launch these things. And the Carney is going to go detected, launch, shot, detected, launch, shot, detected. And now they're, they're done. They fired off 90. And as Larry said, they don't have the tenders anymore. You can't bring up the ship that goes resupply in. in, in, in they got to pull the Carney out. And then who's going to replace the Carney? Some other funky named ship that's going to fire off 90 missiles and have to go. And another one and go. There's only so many, you know, missile destroyers in a carrier battle group. And when they deplete this stuff, the carrier's got to go because it can't yeah. stay there. Something's going to hit the carrier. And now here's the other thing. <clears throat> What have the Ukrainians been using that's driving the Russians crazy in the Black Sea? The, uh, the, the underwater drones. The underwater drones. Well, Russia captured some of them. And I don't know if you saw it, Larry, but Russia just published photographs saying, we've just produced our own underwater drone. And Russia yeah. has really good relationships with the Iranians. So I guarantee you that if Russia produced an underwater drone, the Iranians are producing an underwater drone. And if the Iranians produced it, the Houthi have it. And so we're going to be right. sitting there going, shoot down missile, shoot down missile, shoot down missile. Holy sheesh, you bad word again. Got to watch out. Got 20 underwater drones coming at me. It's over, ladies and gentlemen. We lost a carrier. 5,000 Americans are dead. This is the reality of the carrier battle group. It's a legacy system going back to World War II that has no application in modern warfare whatsoever. Um, America has been exposed as literally the, 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 the empty shell that we are. It's not so much about the Red Sea. The Strait of Hormuz has just been guaranteed. We just we just lost the Strait of Hormuz because the whole idea of the Strait of Hormuz was the perception that America could do something. Well, that's been exposed as a lie. So the Iranians are empowered. The Saudis and the UAE is going. I think it's time we have to re 
rethink our strategic relationships here because America can't defend anything. The whole aspect of what America was doing with power projection was the potential of action that creates deterrence. We don't have the potential of action. Where can we go, Larry? Where can we go? We can't go into Europe. We've proven that. Yeah, we, we, we can't defend the Red Sea against the Houthi. Uh, we, we're, and we think we want to hook and jab with the Chinese in the Pacific. Are we high? America has been exposed as a nation that spends a trillion dollars a year on a military that can't do anything. Yeah. Well, and, and in fact, the, the uh, again, I had not really focused on the capability of the destroyers, their, their limited capability. I really, it had never entered my mind to explore the concept of a expeditionary Navy vice a forward-based Navy. Uh, I, I made some assumptions that were completely wrong. And once you wake up to it, and, I, and again, I hadn't even thought about uh, the Strait of Hormuz until you pointed it out. You're absolutely right. You know, the, the tactic is real simple. All any country has to do is assemble 300,000 drones capable of launching uh, some sort of explosive device that can create damage on a, on a, a maritime vessel. And then launch them in swarms. You're either you're going to overwhelm the the defense systems that the U.S. Navy has, and again, none of this is classified. It's all you know. It's wide open, um, and uh, then you can start sinking ships. Now, the the, the Chinese, the, the, everything the United States is doing out there off the coast of China, is just ridiculous. You know, the United States is trying to pick a fight that we can't even win. We can't even finish it. So, uh, you know, one of the articles I linked to into my piece uh, was called Rebalance the Fleet Toward Being a Truly Expeditionary Navy. That was eye-opening. And that was just published in September of 2023. So what we've got is uh, the phrase I've used before. The United States has the most expensive military in the world. We've got one of the most expensive, least capable navies in the world. That's that's the shocker. And you know, Scott, what do you think? What's why do you think they're delaying? Yeah, I mean, at this point, Yemen has done everything that in normal times when we thought we had an expeditionary navy, we would have already launched. And we're not launching. Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, because a it, it, again, it's if if you went in the ring with Mike Tyson, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> you're expecting I'd be out of that breath when, from running. <laughs> yeah, when when he when he hits you, you you're expecting to die. So imagine yeah. you're going in the ring with Mike Tyson, and oh God, God, and he he just lines up and he hits you, and it's nothing. You're like, what the hell? Hits you again, nothing. Yeah, you hit him, he go, he's hurting. You're like, I got this. See, America's Mike Tyson, but without the punch. Yeah, we've yeah. all hyped up. We've, we, you know, I, I likened it earlier. You know, when I played football in college, all the linemen. I was a tight end, but I was originally a wide receiver, so I was a very small tight end. Um, all the linemen, you know, go in there and they bench press, and they all got the you know three hundred pound club, the three fifty pound club, the four hundred pound club in terms of their bench press. I never got above two and a quarter. So I didn't earn any of the big t-shirts, but, um, but they're all out there, but it's like a guy that, uh, that in college, you know, is pumping up. He's got the 400 pound club. And now he comes back to the 10 year reunion and he's got the 400 pound club t-shirt on there and he's bringing people into the gym and he's like, everybody's expecting him to lift 400 pounds and he, he gets up to 250, and then he stops and he, and he starts talking and drinking water. And you're like, well, where's 400? Can't do it anymore. That's America. Yeah. We everybody's looking at the expecting the four hundred pound club, and you got a guy that can't bench two bench two and a quarter anymore. That's that's America. We don't want to act because the second we act, we're exposed as a fraud, and all that deterrence goes away. All the again coming back to what Tony Blinken said, we have to deal with China from a position of strength. He just said that, but a position of strength means that we have to have the perception of capability. If we expose the fraud that we are with the hoodie, because Larry, again, mobile relocatable targets. That's a fancy way yeah, of saying yeah. mobile missile. I, I did that around. during the Gulf War. That was my thing, hunting scuds. We didn't kill a single one. 
Couldn't, didn't know how to do it. And we haven't gotten any better. And so we're going to engage now in a very expensive air campaign against the Houthi, and we're not going to kill anything. They're going to keep launching, and it just exposes as a fraud. And the whole idea of you know this potential is to intimidate the Iranians into saying, don't begin with us because you think you have mobile missiles, but we have the American Navy that's very good at hunting. Oh, wait a minute. We just couldn't even deal with the Houthi. So I don't think we want to pull this trigger because the moment we pull the trigger, any pretense of American capability is gone. Yeah. The other thing is this coalition we've assembled ain't much of a coalition. Um, it will fall apart instantaneously. And then the most important thing is what happens when the Houthi take out the Saudi oil fields? Yeah. We don't have an answer to that. So I think, you know, we've done a lot of bluffing. The smart thing for the United States at this point in time would be literally, look, we made a decision. We're going to let the Israelis kill as many Palestinians as possible. So the smart thing to do is just tell Israel, suck it up for a couple of weeks, um, kill as many Palestinians as you want to. And then come January, you got to let the humanitarian good, because all the Houthis say is we'll stop the moment you let humanitarian good come into, come into Gaza. Mm -hmm. Stop the killing, let the humanitarian goods in, and we will open this baby up. But what we're going to do now is empower the Houthi to come up with different terms. Because now the Houthi look around saying, wait a minute, we could ask for more. You know, it's like doing one of those business negotiations and you find out that, you know, you low bid and, and you could have gone for more. The Houthi are finding out that they have more leverage than they, they possibly. Yeah. And they're still backed by the Iranians now who are going to be empowered. This is a game I, I use that term all the time. It gets me in trouble, but it's a game changing. It's a game changing thing that's going on right now. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, and look, the other day, uh, the, the Houthis, they, they shot down a Reaper drone, a $30 million ISR platform. And I, I'd, I'd love to know what they shot it down with, how much money they actually invested to shoot down a $30 million drone. But I, I'd be willing to bet it was less than $500,000 which that's a pretty good return on investment. Yeah. And, you know, I think that has to also be weighing on the military planner's minds that the, you know, it, it, Scott noted, one, we don't have the stain power. Two, uh, when we have to pull out, it's going to make us look weak. Three, we're not even sure we can put ISR safely up in the area to find out where they're located so we know what we're shooting. Uh, so it's, a, it's, not a, it's not an easy task. And, you know, these... These damn Houthis, boy, they just won't cooperate. They won't put together fixed military bases that we can easily target. <laughs> How dare they? Didn't they? Don't they know about that international based rules order? <laughs> They're yeah. ignoring the memo. All right, All right. Uh, with Operation uh, Prosperity Guardian, as the United States is calling it, it Scott and, and Larry, I think you're alluding to and, and directly stating this point altogether that you know the u.s military is pretty hollowed out it's the it bark no bite but at the same time this is quite the bark this is a coalition of the willing last time that happened in this particular conflict it was a saudi led u.s from the rear coalition that did wage a pretty uh, disastrous and uh, uh, very uh, just uh, genocidal hell uh, on Yemen that's not happening right now and, and you're saying that it's probably not there's probably not going to be a major strike so why then even form this coalition and how how is what will happen because can it just sit and play at war like they do mm -hmm. in the South China Sea for example is is that what's going to happen I mean I, I it just it does baffle my mind a bit that all of this trouble is being spent on something that has absolutely no bite. Well, look at what they sent. Canada, Canada's contribution, three staff officers. <laughs> um, Britain, they, they've sent a ship that hasn't been able to get out of dry dock. And they're really worried that it's going to break down while it's out there in the Red Sea. And they're going to be spinning around in a circle, not able to do anything. This thing's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, it, it, again, we just come down to, you know, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow your house down. Um, but we can't blow anything down and we're huffing and puffing. And it, if 
if you're going to say you have a capability, you, you should be prepared to do it. Um, you should, you know, you should be prepared to follow through. Um, the United States, I think, look, politics is a funny thing, uh, too. And Biden, you know, somebody may make the decision to initiate a bombing campaign just because we have to do something, but it will be disaster because we, we can't sustain. It's very expensive to bomb. I just want people to understand that, you know, sorting out the number of aircraft that we're going to have to sort out uh, with sustained sorties, um, the fuel, the the wear and tear on the aircraft, the bombs, uh, keeping that air carrier in play, uh, shooting down all the Houthi drones are going to be coming at them. Uh, we're going to bankrupt ourselves. Uh, and, you know, we can't keep that, that, that force in play. Hopefully we don't lose anything, but the, the real thing is that the, we're going to find out the Houthi will find out that we're, we can't beat them. Um, and then the world realizes they can't beat them. This is why I think they probably won't uh, do it. But politics is strange. We are entering the really silly season of American politics right now. And Joe Biden's sort of in a desperate, you know, he's, he, he lost Afghanistan. He's lost Ukraine. He's losing Israel. Um, now you got the hoodie, which means you're going to lose Iran, which means in China's watching this too. Um, basically, what we're doing in Israel is in, in what we've done with Ukraine is in a very short period of time, we've gone from the world's preeminent superpower to the laughing joke. That doesn't mean we can't kill people. Of course we can kill people. We can kill a lot of people, but we can't win. And that's the thing. We can't close the deal anymore. Yeah. yeah can, can you imagine being a Chinese intelligence analyst in uh, February of 2022? And you were asked to assess the ability of the United States to produce and supply 155 millimeter artillery shells. I suspect that that Chinese analyst or the Russian analyst for that matter would have projected a far greater capability with respect to what the United States could do. And th that would have created some caution. And now what they've seen with their own eyes that the United States can't do it. We we can we can produce maybe in one year what Ukraine would fire in one month. And so all of a sudden these countries that has got you know it was a great analogy that we had built ourselves up like the great and powerful wizard of oz. And it turns out we're just a short little fat guy behind a curtain that uh, a lot of the stuff we claim we can do we can't do. And then the real the the real sort of audacity is we've got uh, U.S. military planners instructing the Ukrainians on how how to fight a peer to peer war. Now that that's like going to some guy to learn how to shoot a rifle, and the guy's never shot a rifle. So you don't want to take rifle shooting instruction from somebody that's never shot a rifle. And you know the reality is. There's nobody in the world that's fought a peer-to-peer -peer battle, uh, except for Russia now. <laughs> and they've got ample experience doing it. And because when you read back that, you know, one of the postmortems that the Washington Post did on why the counteroffensive failed, uh, I was stunned that in the when they did the exercises beforehand, they did war gaming, tabletops, they left out the assumption about. Well, you don't need fixed-wing aircraft to provide close air support. And you don't need that rotary-wing aircraft either that can also provide close air support as well as evacuate a wounded for the battlefield. We'll just take those out of there. Hello? I, I mean, you know, that's like saying, yeah, I'm going to go drive the car on the freeway, only I, I'm going to put on a blindfold, see how I do. Uh, you're going to crash. So, I mean, it's just, th this is what... The, the failure of the U.S. military across the board, it's its not just one thing. It's a layered uh, a layered problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. <laughs> See, we got a visitor. Um, no, it is. <laughs> and maybe to close, uh, you know, I've kept you almost for two hours now. So maybe to close, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, we can begin with Scott on uh, prospects geopolitically 2024. Where are things? Where are things headed? Where is the U.S.? I guess we call U.S. NATO axis. Where is it headed? 
and where is the rest of the world headed? Uh, what can we expect? Um, huge question, but just want to kick it to you, Scott, to, to close it. And Larry, final word. Well, I think you're going to see that the United States is, uh, you know, Larry talked about the rapid, I don't I can't remember, the devolution or devolution or, yeah, yeah. or of Ukraine. Um, I think we're going to see the rapid devolution of the United States, um, you know, because, it, again, how quick, it, it, Larry brought up a wonderful analogy, the Wizard of Oz. I just watched it again because, you know, it's that time of the year. Um, but, you know, at the beginning, the wizard is everything. The wizard, you're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And when he, when they first see him, you know, oh, I'm the great and powerful wizard. And, and then suddenly the, 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 the devolution of the wizard. Uh, all you had to do is have Toto come in and pull the, car the the curtain back, and you realize that all that was fake. None of it was real. Um, Toto's done pull the curtain back. The world's seen how fake America is. Um, I don't think I, I, we have gotten this far because we've been bad for a long time. We've been we've been rotting from the inside, but we've gotten this far based upon reputation um, and you know, and, and, and arrogance and people have been buying into the bluff. The bluff's been called by the Houthi. The bluff's been called by everybody, Russia. Um, so I, I think the world is going to go through a very rapid transition. Russia's in charge of BRICS this year. This ain't going to be passive. I mean, China had BRICS, um, you know, um, and, and, and they were very good, but there's only a limited, at that time, you still believed in America's potential. I think America is going to not collapse, but we are going to be de-emphasized on the world stage. The world's tired of us. Israel broke our moral authority. Ukraine broke our, you know, our, our, our military potential. Um, you know, we're going to have to redefine ourselves, and this may take decades, but in the meantime, Russia has redefined itself. China, we haven't talked about China. China is sitting there, um, like this 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 huge economic engine that we don't appreciate, just like we don't appreciate the size of Russia and the potential of Russia. China's big, man. China's got a lot of capabilities. I think 2024 is going to be the year of um, that that America devolves politically. I think the 2024 election is going to be an absolute disaster and for American uh, democracy, but also geopolitically. I think the world's going to realize that America just doesn't matter anymore. And I mean, the whole world is going to realize this quickly. What happens when the when the South Koreans and the Japanese realize that America is nothing? You know, suddenly all this arrogance towards North Korea is going to have to be ratcheted down. Um, so that's what I see for 2024. I see this being the year of, uh, of of America's redefinition on a global stage, and it's not going to be redefined in a better way. This is this is going to be a very bad year for America. Yeah, I wish I wish to offer us a more hopeful vision, but <laughs> I can't. Um, you know, the United States has been in this self-delusion mode for uh, for it's really accelerated over the last three years. To hear these generals, Petraeus, Hodges, uh, and, and others that have gone on air repeatedly said, "Oh yeah, Ukraine's going to punch through the Russian lines like." A hot knife through butter. They're going to be at the Crimea by the by August. Uh, there's no way. The Russia has no good army. It's it's having to drag its conscripts into it forcibly. They don't have good leadership. They they're running out of missiles. They're, they're running out of rockets. They're they're lagging. By, I mean, it's one lie after another lie after another lie. And this is not just. This isn't being done to deliberately spread misinformation. They believe this stuff. They really, truly believe this stuff. And it goes back to the failure to come to grips with reality. And so the, the reality that's facing America now is instead of having two political parties that are pretty stable, uh, we're, we're going to be in the midst of a genuine chaos You've got Robert F. Kennedy, who's going to be running <clears throat> as an independent. Uh, Donald Trump will probably be the Republican nominee, but there's a significant number of establishment Republican types that are going to oppose him. Uh, there's a group called No Labels. They're coming out with a candidate 
probably in March, that they they genuinely believe that they have a legitimate path to victory. And then you've got the Democrats who are trying to dump Joe, Joe Biden as we speak and figure out how to get Gavin Newsom or maybe Michelle Obama in the big chair. This so the the political scene is going to be chaotic. There's there's nobody in control of it. What has been I think really what has been exposed now with Yemen is the United States is a is like that big Chinese balloon that flew over the United States. A lot of hot air, flying high, but turned out to be a nothing burger. And uh, unfortunately, that's where we're at. And uh, before we leave, uh, before I let you guys go, uh, do you want to just uh, plug where they can find you, where the audience can find you? Scott, you want to go first? It's easy. ScottRitterExtra.com. One-stop shop. Uh, go there. You can get podcasts. You can get my Substack. any other articles that I write. Uh, I'm at Sonar21.com. That has all the other links. Sonar21.com. Yes, and all of those are in the video description. Well, uh, Larry, pleasure to have you on um, for you, the Dan. first time here. Thanks for coming on, Scott. Uh, good to be with you again. Um, um, hope you enjoy Russia again. And uh, good to see that you got to go, Larry. Take good care, and hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. All right, All right. guys. Merry Christmas. So Happy New Year's. Yep. Yes. Happy nice holidays. You. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night, Scott. All right. All right. So we had a great conversation there with Scott Ritter, Larry Johnson. Unfortunately, um, Ray McGovern was unable to join. Uh, hopefully we hear from him soon. Uh, it was agreed that he would come on, but he was unable to come, obviously. And uh, But we wish him the best and hope he does. Uh, hope he's all right and hope everything is OK with him. But um, with all of that said, everyone, a few things. First, uh, well, I want to give shout outs to uh, all of the moderators. Let me just see where you all are. Uh, we have Desert Mantis. We have uh, the Quantum Alchemist. We have Joe OWS. We have Valley. So thanks to all of you where we have Notary. So we have a lot of uh, moderators here today, and it was quite a big crowd. So appreciate all of your efforts. I want to thank everyone, of course, who's viewing, who's liked the stream, subscribed to the channel, all of that good stuff. And of course, I want to shout out to all the Patreon paid members, all the Substack paid members, all the YouTube members who are in the audience. Thanks so much for supporting this work. You can do all of those good things. Subscribe to my work as a paid member in the video description, Patreon being the best place.